fat embolism is the topic and fat embolism happens uh, typically in a scenario where you have a fracture of a long bone usually uh, in the lower extremities but it can also be of a fracture of the pelvis and it can happen in other scenarios as well and more commonly in closed fractures uh, rather than open and a typical scenario is that a person has uh, some sort of trauma maybe a motor vehicle accident develops a fracture and then develops a fat emboli and what is a fat emboli a fat embolus is basically these fat globules that are released from the bone during the time of a fracture and then what happens is these fat globules can travel to the lung and then eventually obstruct the uh, pulmonary vessels and that is essentially uh, a fat embolism now the f the fat globules can travel to two other locations as well the uh, they can travel to the brain and that's uh, known as a cerebral embolism and they can also travel to the skin capillaries and um, so that's known as the dermal capillaries and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, when I uh, talk about the classic triad so the good news is that fat embolism has a classic triad three very distinct things that happen when a person develops a, a fat embolism now remember the scenario is somebody has a fracture most commonly of a long bone um, in some sort of a trauma event and then approximately one to three days later they develop symptoms of fat embolism when these fat globules that were released from the bone start traveling to the lung or the brain or the skin so the first part of the classic triad is what they called respiratory changes are basically uh, happening directly as a result of the flat fat globules obstructing the pulmonary vessels and for example difficulty breathing uh, hypoxia that's a very very uh, big one where the oxygen uh, concentration PO2 goes down and that will be very evident um, on uh, physical exam history and on the vital signs the next part is neurologic changes and these happen uh, directly because of the fat globules uh, going to the brain and basically we're talking about a cerebral embolism and the examples of resp neurologic uh, changes include uh, confusion altered mental status drowsiness and so on uh, if very serious it can also lead to seizures and the third one is a classic rash that happens uh, known as a petechial rash and the petechial rash happens because the emboli uh, travel to the dermal capillaries and that leads essentially to this rash occurring so this is a very very important part of the presentation of fat embolism so please remember the, the classic triad now how do you diagnose this well essentially you know really the diagnosis has to do with the classic triad and it also has to do with the history uh, history and, and the classic triad are pretty conclusive diagnostic criteria now there are other things as well other lab tests and um, a long list of other uh, things that could happen but really these two things are the main so just to reiterate you've got a fracture of a long bone and then the person about one to three days later will develop uh, the classic triad which includes um, the respiratory changes which are dis difficulty breathing hypoxia the uh, the petechial rash and then the neurologic uh, symptoms such as confusion, altered mental status. The treatment, well, unfortunately, uh, 
fat embolism, there's no actual specific therapy. The most important thing is symptomatic treatment. You have to sort of, uh, because of the hypoxia, you have to give them uh, supplemental oxygen and probably some ventilation uh, before the person can start uh, breathing adequately on their own and have a, a good pulse ox. And then, of course, you have to treat the uh, treatment of the fracture. Mobil immobilization, early immobilization will help uh, reduce the incidence of fat embolism as well. So let's take a look at some vignettes and see what this looks like in a patient presentation. A 41-year-old man is brought to the emergency department by paramedics after being found conscious at the scene of a motor vehicle accident. He had been the passenger in a high-speed collision and was thrown a distance of 20 feet through the front windshield. An evaluation reveals a fracture of both femurs, the pelvis, the left tibia, and the left humerus. The patient is admitted to the intensive care unit for observation. 24 hours later, he becomes confused and markedly dyspneic. 100% oxygen is administered via face max, but he remains with a PO2 of 54. Numerous petechiae have developed diffusely on all four extremities and on his trunk. Which of the following is most likely cause of his clinical condition? Well, this is a classic clinical vignette for fat embolism. You've got, usually it doesn't even appear this classic. You've got all three things. Um, you've got the dyspnea, which is the respiratory changes. You've got the... Um, uh, hypoxia, you've got the altered mental status, confusion, and then you've got the petechiae. And then you have a very classic history that he's fractured actually not just one, but several bones. So the fat globules have definitely been uh, released from these bones and are obstructing the pulmonary vessels, have traveled to the brain, and have also uh, traveled to the capillaries in the skin. The next question. 24-year-old woman is admitted to the hospital after a broken femur. The patient was in a motor vehicle accident 20 hours ago and was brought to the hospital by EMS. On the scene, she was found belted in the car in the driver's seat, and her only documented injury was a leg fracture. She had no loss of consciousness or altered mental status. On arrival to the hospital, radiographs confirmed a fracture of her femur. She was stabilized overnight and scheduled for surgery the next day. Which of the following is a major surgical risk for this patient? Well, a major risk of lower extremity orthopedic procedures is some sort of embolism, usually due to fat or blood. And of course, the blood clots we all know about. But in this case, because of this fracture, uh, especially of a long bone, you want to think of a fat embolism. So the answer is choice C. Interestingly, blood clot or blood embolism is not even one of the choices so it makes it a little easier to choose. And then finally, a 61-year-old woman is status post a total uh, hip replacement. She underwent an uneventful replacement with hardware under spinal anesthesia. She is brought to the PACU, sedated but alert and oriented. Her medical history is significant only for hypertension and gout, for which she takes allopurinol and atenolol. On arrival to the PACU, she complains of some mild shortness of breath and chest pain. Over the past three hours, her shortness of breath significantly worsens, and she has pleuritic chest pain on her right side. Temperature is 98, blood pressure is 100, pulse is 128, respirations are 32. She appears markedly dyspneic, but is alert and oriented. Physical exam is remarkable for clear lung fields, and jugular venous pulse is visible at 12, with the patient at 30 degrees elevation. There is no chest wall tenderness on palpation. Most appropriate immediate action is, well, she had some uh, orthopedic procedure, and then all of a sudden, she's got this uh, pulmonary uh, changes. She's got shortness of breath, has a difficulty breathing. She's got elevated JVP. And then um, they're basically saying, what should you do? Immediate action. Well, part of the supportive therapy of fat embolism, which is most likely what she has, is uh, immediate supportive care. There's no actual cure or magic treatment. And the supportive care for somebody who's dyspneic and having difficulty breathing, of course, is giving oxygen. And the rest uh, can happen afterwards if necessary. But most immediately, uh, 
you need to help her with her breathing. So that would be give patient supplemental oxygen by face mask.